Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, the recent murder of the Italian ambassador to the Democratic Republic of Congo has shined a spotlight on a region that is grappling with unprecedented levels of poverty, disease and guerrilla warfare. I'll be talking about the potential implications of last week's brutal killing with the writer and activist Vava Tampa. Then later, demonstrators have been taken to the streets of Angola, demanding political reform and equal opportunities. I'll be discussing this and more with Ed Milson Angelo, director of the humanitarian charity Change One's Life. Let's start the programme with news from here in the UK, where earlier in the week, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Shunak, unveiled a £65 billion boost for Covid-hit businesses and workers at the highly anticipated spring budget. Some of the key points include the extension of the coronavirus job retention scheme, also known as furlough. This will be phased out until the end of September and is capped at £2,500 a month for employees who have been advised by the government to stay at home. Self-employment grants will continue and will be extended to include those who have recently filed a tax return. The minimum wage will be increased to £8.91 per hour from next month. For beleaguered business, rates relief has been extended alongside the cut in VAT, which will remain at 5% until the end of September. There's also a £5 billion grant scheme to help local pubs, bars and restaurants and shops reopen as the lockdown is eased. This is worth £6,000 per premises. There were no changes to the most common tax bills, though the Chancellor said income tax thresholds will be frozen until 2026 after next year's planned increases and corporation tax will rise from 19 to 25% in 2023. But small firms with profits under £50,000 will still enjoy the lower 19% rate. The Chancellor's early warning that he will demand more money from companies and most individual taxpayers too makes him one of the first policymakers from rich countries to set out a plan to tighten budget policy after the pandemic. The first part is this. We're going to keep economic support in place until well past the point that we exit lockdown. The furlough scheme, support for the self-employed, business grants, business rates, holidays, tax cuts and the temporary universal credit uplift have all been extended and generously. And so, while I have chosen to freeze personal tax thresholds, some of the most generous in the world, I am not going to increase the rates of income tax, national insurance or VAT. And I am not going to find the money that we need by taking it from public services like schools or the NHS. Freezing tax thresholds is fair, asking more of those on higher incomes. And we're going to ask large businesses who have made a profit to contribute as well. Two years from now, well past our recovery in 2023, corporation tax on company profits will increase to 25%. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by our business correspondent, Simon Pusey. Simon, it appears as if the Chancellor has gone from being Father Christmas to Scrooge pretty much overnight. Well, I think, yeah, there's, it depends how you look on it, really. Um, I think the main thing about this budget was there were no real massive shocks. Um, a lot of people were sort of expecting there to be maybe some huge headline figures. There are obviously um, still some big numbers and there are always going to be some huge numbers given how much he's already spent and borrowed. So um, borrowed 355 billion this year and spent 407 billion in the last fiscal year supporting the economy and business and jobs. And I think that all seemed to sort of rob the opposition and Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer, of a kind of um, maybe attack weapon was because these figures are so mind-blowing. Um, uh, the main line of attack that Labour were using is one that they've used before, which is this is um, not changing inequality or helping the economy and helping poorer people climb the ladder, but it's merely papering over the cracks in the economy that we already have. Um, he also said that Rishi Sunak had barely mentioned um, inequality um, or the social security system and trying to fix that. So that was Sir Keir Starmer and Labour's main point of attack. It's worth pointing out universal credit as well. They pointed to 
a lot of people asking why they have just um, extended the uplift by six months of this £20 instead of um, making that permanent. A lot of people pointing out that poverty will not be over when COVID is, is controlled or is managed. The CBI, the Business Lobbying Group, welcomed many of the announcements for businesses. I know you've already covered a lot of these, but the, uh, the VAT freeze of 5% for a lot of the businesses. Lots of grants that we've already seen are being continued as well. Obviously, the furlough scheme is the main headline grabbing one, but um, a different view in terms of corporation tax, um, moving corporation tax to 25%, which they will for quite a few businesses, um, in one leap will cause a sharp intake of breath for many businesses and sends a worrying signal to those planning to invest in the UK. That's according to the CBI. They would say that, obviously, because they are a business lobbying group. Um, the, the Chancellor spoke a, a lot of um, before this announcement, and it was obviously leaked in many publications, as is what this government likes to do, is kind of leak the nice parts, the positive parts, they think, of, um, of these announcements before um, the actual announcement. But um, it was about tax rises. Rishi said there's going to be no tax rises, and that's what a lot of people thought we may see. Actually, I think a lot of people will see the freezing of the threshold at which people pay basic and higher um, tax is kind of a tax cut because for people who earn more in the next few years, they will find themselves in a higher tax bracket and they'll have to pay more tax. So a lot of people saying, well, that will make a lot of money for the uh, for the Treasury, and that is a kind of a tax cut. And then the final thing I'd say is that the, the, the Tories seem to spend a lot of time talking about their climate change policies, especially Boris, who likes to be seen cycling around and Boris bikes and, you know, the Conservatives like to see themselves as the Green Party, really. Um, some people asking why there's a freeze on fuel duty um, um, for the 11th year running um, and as the Office for Budget Responsibility says that this this freeze costs 900 million pounds a year and at such a time when we are supposedly having to be fiscally tight and securing our belts and go, having to pay back over many decades this huge sum of money whether that is sensible in a, in a time when we're supposed to be you know promoting green policies so I think there's a lot a lot of sort of detail here to go over um, but no real kind of massive shock or headline grabbing figure other than Furlough has obviously been extended, um, and the same for freelancers will receive the same benefits that they have been receiving. Thank you, Simon. Now to a view from the opposition. Kate Osamor, a British Labour and Cooperative Member of Parliament, joins me now. Kate Osamor, it's always a pleasure to have you on Channels Business Global. Thanks once again for taking time out of your busy schedule, because I know, especially the Labour MPs, you're going through the Chancellor's budget with a fine tooth comb. Some of the big ones that I've picked out are the extension to the furlough scheme, the maintenance of the universal credit uptick and a rise in the national minimum wage. I haven't got into the taxes yet, but I suppose there were no surprises in the giveaways. No, not at all. Thank you so much for welcoming me on your show, Julianne. It's always great to see you. Um, as you rightfully said, we have, as Labour MPs, been going through this budget. This budget, um, was the, the country were crying out for it. They were crying out for a road to recovery. They were crying out for, you know, the rights to be wronged, um, the wrongs to be right, to, you know, put it, put it the right way around, Kate, because um, people are really struggling. Um, they're finding it very, very difficult. And I was hoping that the budget would reflect the demands which I'm seeing in my inbox day in, day out from business owners, from family members, from businesses that are going under, from um, small, medium-sized businesses to, I mean, the list goes on and on. And I'm sorry that this budget just did not cut the mustard. And um, unfortunately, more and more people are going to um, lose out because of a budget which does not reflect what the country needs. I think sometimes, okay, especially for our viewers in Nigeria, you know, they read a headline that says £65 billion in extra spending for people living in England and the devolved administrations. They think that's a lot of money. But so can you explain uh, some of the day-to-day -day hardships that some people in your constituency and others in the UK have been, you know, con condemning with or been living through because of um, the pandemic. You're right, Julianne. Um, when people look at the budget, when they look at, sorry, the headlines and think of, you know, 65 billion, it seems a lot of money. But what's missing in that headline is that there's been many gaps in, you know, the funding beforehand. So, for instance, when you look at an NHS worker, they're not being paid the amount they should be paid. They are not um, being respected. They don't have the equipment. They don't have, you know, the day-to-day -day things which make the NHS run, you know, in succinct. Unfortunately, that is not there. 
there has been a pay freeze for you know public sector workers um you know you look at local authorities the councils which we pay our taxes into majority of those councils which are labor run have had gaps in their funding so if there's already gaps there when the the, the big headline comes out it's very easy to be sucked into that there's also been a cut in foreign foreign aid um you know you look at the way that many many people are struggling and you think yeah that's a massive amount of money but unfortunately it's more than likely going to be going to people who are supposedly um there to to run a service last week um kate i had dj abbas on the show he's a popular entertainment consultant who i'm sure you're familiar with and i spoke to him about you know the loss of income for tens of thousands of people within the Nigerian community. You know those people on a Saturday who get paid for decorating halls, um, for catering. They've lost so much money and many of them just haven't been able to benefit uh, from some of these handouts the government has been giving because they don't have access to funds. There's a name for it, which I believe it's called No Recourse to Funds. I know yes. you've been speaking about it any chance you get in the House of Commons. Can you just explain that? And where are we with this? Has the, gov the, the Chancellor, you know, reversed any of these age-old policies? Um, you're, you're very right to, to raise what DJ Abbas was speaking about. Um, many Nigerians, um, and not only Nigerians, many people from West Africa, from the Caribbean, when they are sorting out their immigration status, the, the, the Home Office puts on their name or puts attached to them that they have no recourse to public funds, which basically means they, they're not entitled to sick pay. It basically means that they, if they fall foul to, for any reason, even if they lose their job, I mean, of course, the pandemic has presented horrible fears, but there are a lot of people that have to work cash in hand because that's the only way they can survive. Now, if a hall or the mosque or the church is now closed, those people will not have a job. They won't be able to go in and they can now not apply for sick pay which let's be honest is not a lot of money anyway but this is part of the hostile environment and a lot of people do not understand that if you are caught up within the hostile environment it means that you at any point in time could be deported you have to sign on you have no risk there's no respect in your existence and a lot of these people have british born children and those children are not even they can, they're not even entitled at some in, well they are entitled to sorry but they don't always receive free school meals which as we all know has been a massive campaign um, and we've had the fantastic support and leadership from young Marcus Rashford, who himself went through that before he became a successful footballer. But again, a lot of people do not talk about it. Most people who have no recourse to public funds either come from Nigeria, from you know Jamaica, from Ghana, from Bangladesh, people who are black and brown, basically. So it's a racist polity, which affects our people the most. And a lot of people don't talk about it because we work hard. So we don't need the state, we don't rely on the state. But right now, if you have to go to work, but there is no work, or you're prepared to risk your life, because we all know our communities have been the hardest hit with COVID-19. So it's just a double whammy, triple whammy, and um, we need to talk about it. And as you rightfully said, whenever I do get the opportunity, I speak up about it, because you know something, these are, these are people that should have dignity and have respect in their life, and they're not being given it by this government just because of their immigration status, which is totally unfair. Absolutely. Kate, thank you for constantly, you know, giving a voice to the voiceless and talking about issues that others would rather wish didn't exist or brush under the carpet, but have to be spoken about if they are to be resolved. We don't have enough time. We never have enough time. Hopefully, once these restrictions are lifted, I'll have you right next to me here in the studio. Kate Osamo, British Labour cooperative politician who has served as a member of parliament for Edmonton since 2015. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. Coming up on Channels Business Global, I'll be talking about the implications for the DRC following last week's murder of the Italian ambassador with writer and activist Vava Tampa. And I'll be talking about Angola's geopolitical landscape with Edmilson Angelo, director of Change One's Life. See you after the break.
Welcome back to Channel's Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. Last week's murder of Italian ambassador Luca Antanasio, alongside his driver and bodyguard, has once again focused international attention on the interlocking crises in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Although the DRC initiated reforms aimed at strengthening governance in the management of its vast natural resources, the country is ranked 184 out of 190 countries in the latest Ease of Doing Business survey. According to the World Bank, 72% of the population, especially in the Northwest, is living in extreme poverty. All this while the country grapples to contain COVID-19, Ebola and an uprising from various militia groups. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by the activist and writer Vava Tampa. Vava Tampa, thank you so much for joining me on Channel's Business Global. Such a shame that we only talk when such serious incidents like this occur. I've got to ask a pretty straightforward question. What are the implications for a country when a foreign senior ambassador dies on its soil? Huge, tremendous. Um, he exposes the, uh, if you like, just how weak the government or the governance in Congo is. Um, if, I mean, it's one thing um, and that the Congolese government have been unable to protect and look after its people. Um, as your viewers would know, people in Beni, in northeastern of Congo, have been killed by machetes since 2014 in their thousands. And the government has essentially been ignoring it, not even recognizing, not even communicate whenever those massacres had happened. And now we find ourselves few miles away from Beni where the massacre were happening, an Italian ambassador, as well as his bodyguard, and a Congolese gentleman who was working for the World Food Program, being killed, um, exposing simply how weak the government is, and the government found itself in a very tricky situation, finding ways to explain the unexplainable. And we are hoping that with international pressure, this would lead into a proper independent investigation into what happened against the Italian ambassador, but also this would hopefully lead and into some sort of reform and, and dealing with issues of impunity so that we can address the insecurity which is killing Congolese people. Absolutely. There's definitely an international spotlight on the DRC at the moment. I know they certainly like many of the problems in the DRC to be swept under the rug, mainly because they benefit from some of those um, problems. But however, the blame game is heating up. And I've got to say, you know, when you read about some atrocities that happen in a lot of these African countries, you don't see so many aid organisations right at the top of the blame game. Why is that? with the DRC. The United Nations and other aid organisations particularly taking a lot of blame uh, for this murder um, because some say, you know, that they failed in governing or trying to sort out the issues within that region, the eastern region. Is that a fair assessment? Should they be taking so much responsibility and accountability? Listen, I, I understand why people are blaming the UN, but I take a very different view. We need to be absolutely blunt. The UN peacekeeping forces in Congo can only be as strong, as effective as the will of the five UN permanent members of the UN Security Council, which are the US, the UK, the French, um, um, the Russian and the Chinese. And all those are countries with huge, massive mining interest in Congo. So virtually, I mean, it, it's pretty easy in econ economic terms. Now, if you have a state, a country such as Congo with so much resources in such a terrible conditions with militia gangs essentially ruling things, then it's fascinatingly cheaper to get natural resources that you need, the cotton that you want, the gold, uh, the diamonds, and the cobalt, and so on and so forth. Whereas if you have a, a, a proper running and functioning state, then the government of that country and the people of that country would expect that you actually pay a uh, market price for those, those natural resources. So Congo being in such a, you know, terrible um, situation actually benefits a lot of multinational and a lot of countries in the West. So blaming the UN by itself, it's actually misguided. 
Vava Tampa, activist and writer, always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. The decline of Angola from being Africa's top crude producer five years ago to barely pumping more than war-torn Libya today shows the heavy toll a slump in oil industry investment. Dissatisfaction in governance has led to a series of demonstrations against entrenched state corruption, massive unemployment, rising costs of living and loss of political freedoms. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by Ed Milson Angelo, director of the humanitarian charity Chains One's Life and an African study scholar from the University of Oxford. Edmilson Angelo, thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. A pretty shocking statistic here. In a survey recently conducted by Ex Africa, two out of three Angolans are deeply dissatisfied with their government and are pessimistic about their country's outlook. Is this a fair assessment or another African critique? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Juliana. Um, I also had access to the, to the survey. And I might say that um, looking at the survey in part does reflect some of the things that we're seeing in the country right now. And what was interesting about the survey was the fact that the three different age groups that took part on the survey, they pretty much had the same answers, which reflects that maybe people from different ages share the same views of the country. But not to take anything away from the survey, I think the reason why it's so hard for me to maybe say that if, if, it, if it's a fair assessment or not, is the fact that the survey was conducted uh, through the period of the lockdown. And that already can maybe mean that it might have an influence on how people um, respond to the questions. But more than that, also the fact that for me, the survey does reflect a very urban perspective of things. And Angola is more than just one. Angola is 18 provinces. And maybe we have to look at uh, a deeper surveys to see whether that is true or not. And more than that, also, I think when we look at previous surveys on how people view the government, it's important to say that um, it has never been a straight line. It has always been up and downs. And that's why I think for me particularly, the reason why I believe that the real barometer for us to analyze whether people are satisfied or dissatisfied with the government in Angola will be the next year's election. And I say that because not only because it's so close, it's around the corner, but also even from the side of the government, they have now started to look at 2022 as perhaps the year where they will see how much they have done. And I remember towards the, the end of last year when the government, uh, the, the, the president actually hosted a, a talk with the, with the youth, where he pretty much said, look, if you are unhappy with what we are doing, what you have to do, we have to not go out and protest or do radical protest. We need actually to go and express yourself on the ballot box. And I think it will be very important for us to wait for the elections to really see and measure how people are, whether they're satisfied or dissatisfied with the government. And the youth is already starting to create the momentum towards 2022. So I think that will be for everybody the real uh, barometer for us to assess um, whether people are satisfied or dissatisfied with the government. We've all seen the pictures, haven't we, this week of COVAX um, yeah. supplies arriving to various African countries. Angola is being um, is been one of them. How has um, the government um, coped with the lockdown and the pandemic? I know, for example, in Nigeria, there was lots of criticism about this, you know, copy and paste policy of doing exactly what happened in the West, when we know that lockdowns in societies who, you know, survive on going out and getting their daily bread, it just right. wasn't working. Is this is that sentiment the same in Angola? Right. Uh, well, basically, based on what you said, uh, Juliana, like you said, uh, this week, Angola was actually became the first country in the eastern and um, southern region of Africa to receive the vaccines against COVID-19. The country received about 624 doses of um um, of, of, of the um, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccines. And I think that reflects the good job that the government has been doing. I think my assessment of how the government has been handling the pandemic has actually been very positive. I think when we look at how Western countries are today implementing measures that Angola has implemented a year ago, it already shows that maybe some of the things that Angola has done has actually been very well. And to, 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 to actually do a broad analysis of how the government reacted or how they have been dealing with the pandemic, they have been adjusting, they have been learning from the mistakes, and to see that not just the numbers of people who have been dying from COVID has been super low compared to what we have perhaps in the US or even South Africa. But uh, the reality is the matter of that, I think the government has dealt with COVID-19 very well. And many of the pressure that comes from, from, from the public also came as a result of how they saw that the government has been dealing so well with the, with the pandemic. Basically, it became a, 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 a it became a space where people started to question, look, if you can do such a good job 
in dealing with a pandemic. You can also do a very good job in dealing with other issues. Well, those are great words to end the show. And I did want to talk so much more with you, particularly about the transition away from oil. I'll just have to invite you back on the show, won't I? Ed <laughs> Milson Angelo, Director of Change uh, First Life. Change Thank One's Life. Much. Thank you so yes, much for right. joining me on the show. Thank, Thank you, Ed Milson. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today, but do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channel's Business Global. Goodbye.